Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and Baldur's Gate 3. I am back now for what is a pretty challenging concept as a video. Josh asked me to pick the top 5 classes overall, both for pure power but also the impact they have in say an Onimo playthrough. What makes the best class though? Well, I think it's the impact it has in and out of combat and that's also of course in the early mid and late game it needs to be good the whole way basically providing so much relevance to the situations you get yourself into that it's going to carry every moment multiple roles very well like dealing tons of damage and having great control all at once it's the utility that they provide and that can come in different forms now as a heads up this list is based on my knowledge and experience it's of course a subjective take so take it with a grain of salt any of these five picks could probably be ordered in a different order based on your preference and honestly there's more than five fantastic options i just had to pick five with that said let's get started from the bottom at number five then we have pure battle master fighter all the way to 12. This will be our only pick that's just one specific leveling path with one subclass and it's here because I've pretty much been convinced by the comments on the recent class and build videos I've done. For example, I rated the Battlemaster subclass as an S tier pick, one of the strongest in the whole game. But because the other subclasses for fighter aren't as universally impressive, I kept the class ranking at A overall. But if you want the strongest, most versatile options in your party, pure Battlemaster fighter can't really be denied. This is because Battlemaster essentially provides all the utility you might need for whatever fighter build version you're doing. Maybe you're sword and board, frontlining. Maybe you're the striker with a two-hand weapon. Maybe you're a potent ranged DPS build. The fighter has a good option for all of it and finds itself working in many multi-classes because of that. You just need three levels and you'll have your fighter proficiencies if leveled right. It also means a fighting style and obviously by then you'll also have action surge, meaning an extra action once per short rest, pretty much every fight. And the Battlemaster subclass itself with three maneuvers to pick from a long list of 14 options. These are going to be relevant to whatever you might need. Accuracy for your range stuff, repose for counterattacks, maybe disarm for the threatening enemies, force them to focus you as a frontline, push and peel for the team, help the team with a rally, so on and so on. Whatever playstyle you're going for, Battlemaster can provide incredible options with serious impact and that's at just three levels into fighter. But I did say pure Battlemaster fighter. At level seven and 11, you get to pick two more maneuvers, which is incredible. And at level 10, the dice potency goes up, increasing the dice size to a 1d10, which is incredible. By the time you're level 12, you'll have four feats with this pure class, which is awesome. But more importantly, the improved extra attack. This actually stacks with your normal extra attack, meaning two additional attacks after the first one with your main hand weapon. It was Warlock that took a big hit in honor mode, where deep and pack no longer stack with extra attack, so fighter is your best option for that. Plus, fighters become indomitable, meaning if you fail a saving throw, you can roll again once per long rest to potentially not fail, which can be very clutch and specifically on a mode. By no means do I think the awesome potential of, say, Eldritch Knight should be ignored, or the use of a champion build with the right build for crits, but Battlemaster is the king of fighter by no small margin, so I have that class and that concept as number five on this list. Next up at number four, though, I have Wizard, which is absolutely awesome in multiple ways. As a spellcaster with every main spell available, Available to them, there's no real limit to achieving what they need to. If we're talking about honor mode, you should absolutely have pre knowledge to know what's coming, what you're dealing with next, what it's going to be weak to. The ability to learn all the different spells from scrolls, then, it can't really be understated. This range of options provides so much utility in and out of combat. And Wizard boasts three incredible subclasses. The first and easiest pick is Evocation. It makes your AoE spells not even damage your allies, which is awesome. Or the fact that with potent cantrips, you always have a reliable way to land damage every turn, even without spell slots. Later game, you'll get the passive Empowered Evocation, meaning your intelligence modifier is added to the damage rolls with those Evocation spells, so you've got some good damage potential. It's just an easy and effective option, which can be helpful for a hard mode like Honor Mode. But if you want to push things as far as you can, you could go for divination, providing even higher potential for the aware player because those portent die you unlock means each day you have these rolls to enforce. You could have some high, you could have some low rolls, and you spend them intentionally. You make it so that attack you really want it to land doesn't miss. That could be a very important control spell, preventing it from failing at that key moment. Or you could be setting an enemy's attack roll to low, so it does miss. This whole concept is very strong and easily one of the top picks for wizard. Alternative to that, you could go the ultra safe option, which is abjuration, which unlocks the arcane ward. This stacks up a protective barrier layer by layer as you use more abjuration spells. If you upcast those spells, you get more wards at once, and the wards reduce the damage of incoming blows. 10 stacks means minus 10 damage on the blow you just took, which is going to be ultra relevant where you don't want to die in honor mode. Also handy for the team though, since later you get projected ward to help reduce the damage your allies are taking. Overall, I think wizard provides a massive amount of options to the party and works especially best when used by a player who knows what's coming next, making the most of that prep time and preparing spells 
spells that are going to counter the enemy, deal the most damage possible, support the team efficiently. I think a strong caster is just something I can't live without in a party, and Wizard is a very good choice. But right above that, number three, I actually have Sorcerer. Now, unlike Fighter and Wizard, Sorcerer stands above them both in the sheer value that is a party face. A party face is the main character you're going to use to interact in conversation and the open world stuff. These conversations can play a major role in whether you end up in a fight or not. You can get the things you need, bypass entirely dangerous sections through conversation. In honor mode, the value of that can't really be ignored. You definitely want a good one in your party. With Sorcerer spells scaling with charisma, then obviously it's going to be a great pick. In the case of subclasses, Sorcerer has two picks that I think are generally going to be debated as which is better, but both are great. I find Draconic Bloodline the better pick early though, since you get to pick a damage focus and with that, also that element resistance. That's going to half the damage of that resistance type, which is super good. And if you're wanting to meta game, you could respect before any major fight to get extra damage in an element the enemy's weak to, or get the resistance that's going to make the most impact. Plus, each level into the subclass is going to give you a little bit more health, which can be handy. So the single turn damage potential of this subclass is insane. However, it's Storm Sorcerer that I think provides a bit more utility overall. You get the consistent ability to fly, which can be huge for getting out of those tight spots, or just benefiting from the AoE focused damage style of this subclass, be that Cold Blasts or the Lightning based explosions. The Cold stuff is going to provide a lot of control though, alongside the massive AoE damage you have. With a minor multi class for Tempest Cleric though, you can guarantee the damage is maxed out for Thunder and Lightning spells at those key moments. It's going to be amazing control and damage damage all in one, which can still be said about Sorcerer in general. Also, I didn't mention the obvious thing that Sorcerers just get meta magic. That leads to the potent twin cast concept. One common known use of that is the twin cast haste setup. But of course, there's other ones like turning a spell into a bonus action for one particularly effective turn, or all the other utility you get when, say, casting from far or when silenced and so on. Sorcerer can be multi-classed in so many good ways, like the arcane ward wizard we mentioned, or the classic, say, Sorcerdin. Speaking of which, let's talk number two. For me, that is Paladin. Once again, we're talking about a class that's scaling its spells with charisma, meaning it's going to be a good party face, though that'll depend on your build in this case. The Paladin is one of those ultra good classes that starts strong and then just scales super well, basically remaining strong the whole way. In fact, it shines incredibly hard in Act 2 because Radiant Damage is so valuable there. And that's just the class no matter what way you go with it. All of the subclasses are going to be good in their own right. However, as I recently discussed, I would give the best options to two, Oath of Ancients and Oath Breaker. Oath Breaker is going to be the best damage option. This is because of its aura at level 7, Aura of Hate provides extra damage with melee weapons based on your Charisma modifier. This combined with the right setup then leads to the highest burst combos possible for the class. Outside of the really cool theme of being an Oathbreaker, where you're going to get lots of utility and options, like say controlling an undead to steal it from the enemy and use for your own purposes, that could be a great damage sponge, or later, you know, a consistent summon in Animate Dead. On the other hand, you have Oath of Ancients, which is a better defensive option. Its aura by comparison is that defensive one, the aura of warding, giving resistance against spells for you and nearby allies. This can half the damage of spells, which just for the paladin is insane, but it's an aura for your allies that are nearby, meaning this makes a great frontliner or party blocker build, protecting the weaker allies while, yeah, buffing them up at the same time. It's kind of like a combative, tanky support build. If I was playing paladin in honor mode, it'd be one of those two focuses that I'd definitely weave in. Around that, the paladin just provides lots of utility, control of enemies with spells like command or raw healing using your charges, having an extra attack build is always good. I just find Paladin works well in most parties, strong from start to finish, pure leveled, but then it's also a great pick for a multi-class. So I absolutely love it, but I put it at number two, not one. Above Paladin at number one overall for me though, is Bard. Right to the point on this one. Bardic Inspirations, the Jack of All Trades passive, and the fact that you can have three short rests is insane for the party. Bardic Inspirations can be used to buff an ally. A bonus to their attack rolls, ability checks, or even saving throws. And you do it on your turn as a bonus action, so it's not like a problem. The Jack of All Trades passive means half your proficiency bonus comes into play for every ability check you're not actually proficient in. It's like having an answer to every situation. If you don't have a party member ultra good at said thing, you can just use the bar. And of course, with the charisma scaling spells as its main stat and all the other perks, the bard is the ultimate party face. Like I 
I said, I place immense value on that. Also, it's a full caster, so it's always going to have incredible spell slots to work with, no matter what subclass you pick. So, speaking on subclasses and also multi-class options, of which there's a fantastic amount of, the two best subclasses for Bard are College of Swords and Law. College of Swords provides huge DPS benefits to the build, thanks to the flourish attacks. These are all great for different situations, and we actually have a melee and ranged version of each. Commonly brought up though is Slashing Flourish, which lets you attack two targets next to each other at once in melee, or even easier, the ranged version, which lets you use it to attack the same target twice, whether it's standing by another enemy or not. You get a fighting style for those benefits, you get extra attack at level 6. It's a combat-focused bard pick, and it's a very good one. On the other side of things, Lawbard's the spellcaster pick, largely because of magical secrets. Lawbard gets to pick spells from every discipline. You pick one of these at level 6 and another at level 10, and it's how you can get haste into the party, if you're not using one of the classic spellcasters, which can also be said for counter spell. Those are probably my two top picks if I wasn't running another spellcaster in the team. There's also some nice benefits here, like the extra proficiencies you get, when you unlock the subclass, so it's probably the best party face version of the bard because of that. And if I'm thinking of a more supportive caster type, then I definitely lean on lore. So yeah, overall, I just think Bard provides the most in one class, working in a massive amount of different multi-class options. If you want the ultimate party face, it's surely the pick. The raw benefits of Bardic Inspirations and three short rests, that can't be understated either. If I had to pick one class for the top class overall, that's why I pick Bard. But there you have it. That's my top five classes overall with Honor Mode in mind. I hope you can understand my reasoning and also the fact that picking just five is very tough. Remember, it's all subjective. If there's another class you feel deserves a mention for a video like this, you can drop it in the comments and make the suggestion for others. Until next time though, I've been Hollow, you've been you, and thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye